Hey there, welcome back. Uh, this video will focus on the person of Elisha. Uh, we'll take a look, especially from 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, with the chariot uh, that you see over here uh, in this Eastern Orthodox uh, icon, uh, from, from 2 Kings 2 all the way to 2 Kings uh, 9, really. Um, and Elisha also comes back uh, just for a very brief moment in 2 Kings 13, um, and uh, uh, for basically his death. Um, that's that's the conclusion of his story. But really his story ends sometime around the coup of Jehu. So we'll get to that and we'll talk about that when we talk about the fall of the north uh, in the next video. But so uh, this video will focus on the person of Elisha um, who becomes the main character of the Deuteronomistic history from about 2 Kings 2 uh, through to about 2 Kings 9. Um, he takes over from Elijah is obviously like in his in, in the tradition of Elijah. It's really interesting that he becomes uh, he's named right in uh, 1 Kings 19 when God tells Elijah there's going to be someone coming after you, namely Elisha. What's interesting is that he then picks Elisha, and then Elisha kind of disappears from the narrative uh, until really 2 Kings 2. Um, so in any event, Elisha um, and Elijah don't spend a lot of time together on screen, as it were, uh, you know, in, in the narrative of the story. But uh, they're, they're paired together inextricably because of that uh, anointing that, um, that Elisha, Elijah gives to Elisha by throwing his mantle on him, right? Um, so, uh, but in any event, the, there, there are some differences though. They're not the same person. Um, Elisha repeats the miracles of Elijah in some ways and sometimes changes them a bit or, or builds on them. This I think also leads to the pattern of Jesus uh, in some ways uh, imitating, but also developing and building upon and expanding the miracles of Elisha and Elijah. Um, so that this uh, kind of uh, imitation in a way, um, miraculous imitation of one another is a, a sign. Um, it's supposed to be a symbol of who they are, where their power comes from, but also uh, that, that they are pointing to the same God that Elijah was pointing to, that is Yahweh, um, the God of Israel. So uh, the, in, in these uh, stories, too, you can see some differences in, in the way they act. Both Elijah and Elisha are, are called man of God, Ish Elohim, right there. Uh, both of them are described with that pr particular prophetic title that not all prophets have, whereby they can do miracles and they can uh, perform feats that show, that reveal that God's power works through them a bit like a portal. Elisha, more so than Elijah, um, he's less interested in trying to get people to worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone. Those stories that we saw in 1 Kings uh, 18, right, where Elijah is trying to convince people to choose, you have to choose Yahweh and so on, but also his anger at the prophets of Baal and, and how they're an enemy, that seems to be just less in view in the Elisha stories. Elisha is less interested in um, uh, trying to get people to uh, believe only in Yahweh, Yahweh alone. Uh, he he is in, instead um, is he's more of a this the the part of his um, activity that is emphasized is that portal through whom God works in the world in um, unpredictable ways. That is that God's power doesn't just support the king of Israel or doesn't just try to tear down the king of Israel. Um, God doesn't seem to play by any predictable rules that you might imagine. Uh, God's power is, uh, remember what I explained in the, the priestly materials, God's power is like a nuclear reactor, right? Um, it's uh, It can be good or bad depending on how you relate to it. Well, that's, that's very true of Elisha. Um, he does these unpredictable things that both bring life and bring death. So in the stories of Elisha, um, his miraculous power uh, and the miraculous power of God to bring life is, is really underscored. But that same exact power that can bring life can also destabilize power. It can undo and unbuild things that are keeping life from happening. And also there are just times when the power seems to be, the line seems to be crossed or something like that. Uh, you know, people pushing random buttons in the nuclear power plant might cause an explosion. That sort of thing seems to happen with Elisha sometimes. Um, Elisha is a bit of a conflicted character too, because remember in 1 Kings um, 19, when God said that God was going to choose Elisha, um, this seemed to be a really positive thing. You know, Elisha is going to do better than you, Elijah. But then it ended by saying, yeah, Elisha is going to be in charge of some death too. Um, the very last story of uh, Elisha in uh, 2 Kings chapter 13, um, both has this kind of like 
uh, pro-Israel, um, pro-military, pro-fighting, pro-death, um, we're going to win kind of nationalistic furor. And at the exact same time, his, his dead bones bring life uh, to someone else who has died. Um, so he can bring life and he can bring death. Um, and that, in, in, in that, that strange way, that seems to be kind of the sum up of Elisha. Um, but uh, uh, one other thing, and you know, you could say this about Jesus too, that uh, people think that Jesus is, you know, very warm and cuddly and nice. He's, he's only ever nice. He only ever loves and by love we mean hugs people is nice to kids um, that's not true about Jesus right Jesus does make a whip out of cords and hits people and, and beats them up and makes them leave the temple one time right Jesus talks about how um, he's, he told, tells his, his followers to carry swords sometimes um, Jesus says that he, he he came not only to bring uh, reconciliation but sometimes to bring strife um, that the, 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 the strife that follows Jesus will sometimes even break apart families that's not to say that Jesus is primarily about breaking up families but it's to say that God's activity in the world sometimes is a deconstructive power. Sometimes it has to be, right, uh, in order to deconstruct uh, well-built systems or mechanisms that keep people uh, oppressed. So Pharaoh, for example, in, in, in the book of Exodus, right? I mean, there, God gave Pharaoh chances, but Pharaoh wasn't going to unbuild Pharaoh's power by himself. So God had to intervene by deconstructing. And sometimes that comes out in, in ways that seem or are violent. Um, so we have to grapple with this as, as Christians who read this ancient Israelite material to grapple with the, the violent um, context from which these stories come, but also that there is violence in our world today too that sometimes we don't name as violence. Uh, there's very violent systems sometimes that seem to be very peaceful. Um, there's a very famous uh, saying from the ancient world, the, the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana in Latin. The peace of Rome was that Rome conquered people and stopped them from fighting and then dominated them and took all of their material resources, right? And then sometimes gave them things like theaters, you know, aqueducts, uh, some, uh, you know, gymnasium, a, a um, uh, you know, culture, bread and circuses is what the, the Romans called it, right? They gave them some things in return, but also ultimately took most of their wealth that they were able to produce. Um, and this is this is the peace of Rome. Uh, so we can say that, um, that there are certain things that look like peace, um, but uh, it would be very violent to disturb the peace of Rome, right? Uh, the rebellions, the slave rebellions that Rome had, right? That disturbed the peace of Rome were considered violent and terrible and so on. So all to say that uh, uh, to take a careful look at, at what we think of as as um, uh, as violent sometimes, um, and it, I will relate this again to, to the Black Lives Matter movement, of which the protests this summer, in the summer of 2020, were almost all peaceful. Uh, there there was some violence at the kind of margins of some of these uh, um, events, uh, some of that instigated by white nationalist um, violent protesters who uh, surreptitiously joined with Black Lives Matter movements. That might sound like a conspiracy theory, but it's been proved. I mean, people have admitted to this. Um, uh, so th that is to say that there's a... a, a primarily um, uh, peaceful movements can be labeled as uh, terrible violent agitators like Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi, who was called a terribly violent person by the British Empire because even though he was peaceful, his peaceful protest was destabilizing an entire empire. So Elisha, his name actually gives you a bit of an indication of who he is and what he's all about. Just like Elijah's name was my God is Yahweh, or my ale is Yahweh. Uh, Elisha's name is my ale saves. It's, the end of his name is, is from uh, Yasha, the same root that Yeshua, or Jesus' name is from, and, and Joshua as well, Yehoshua. Uh, so that is to say, my God saves uh, is Elisha's name. And that really is Elisha's ministry, is that God is on the side of life ultimately. Um, even if uh, there are times in Elisha's story, especially uh, near the beginning, there's one famous example where he seems to be on the side of death. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, on the whole, uh, Elisha's ministry is one of trying to show that God's life, uh, God is a, a life-affirming God and uh, that this all often comes in unexpected ways through unexpected places and unexpected people. There's some continuity there with Elijah's ministry as well. Um, so in any event, uh, uh, he starts in chapter two with the ascension to heaven. Um, really, we're not exactly sure what happens here. Um, this is a bit like the story of Enoch in Genesis 5, where God takes Enoch and then he is no more. Now, lots of people throughout history have had lots of things to say about what happened to Enoch, that he was taken up into heaven, but that's not said actually in Genesis. It just says Enoch was no more and God took him. Um, according to ancient uh, uses of, of those Hebrew words, it, it looks like God 
kind of ended his life, kind of like uh, God took away Moses at the end or took away Aaron, right, um, uh, at the uh, end of the Pentateuch. Um, uh, in the book of Numbers, right, for, for Aaron. Um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, here, Elisha uh, goes up to heaven, not actually in the chariot. The chariot is nearby. Um, it's, a, it's a chariot of fire, which we'll see comes up again in Elisha's story later. But actually, it's the, it's the whirlwind that picks up uh, uh, Elijah and brings him up um, into, into the sky, into heaven, um, into the air. Um, so there's the, the the Old Testament doesn't say much about what happens. It doesn't give us a lot of information here. What what happens? Where does he go? Um, of course, there's uh, traditions later on in uh, Israelite prophecy. The book of Malachi, uh, right, ends with this famous declaration that uh, the prophet Elijah is going to come again. Uh, we also hear there's a, a statement that Moses, uh, you know, is going to come again. So this idea that kind of the law and the prophets, that's probably, you know, Elijah's representing the prophets, um, uh, that, that he, he will come again someday. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so after that story, uh, Elisha then picks up the mantle of Elijah and is able to, to, to perform miracles with it, uh, like, you know, crossing over the river. It's a little bit like Moses is crossing over uh, the, the sea, right, with the staff, except it's the, it's the cloak uh, of um, Elijah that is the, the implement here. Um, but nonetheless, uh, then from there, Elisha goes on and performs these very strange miracles in chapter two. Um, he goes to a city and uh, takes some some uh, dirt uh, or salt actually, and he, he uses dirt later. He, is, he uses salt, throws it into a, uh, to the water spring, which has been killing people, and it makes the water wholesome. And uh, apparently, it was causing miscarriages, uh, according to, to verse twenty one of chapter two of Second Kings. Um, the water was bringing death, right? So there was this uh, source of life that was supposed to bring life, but instead it was bringing death, and um, Elisha was able to transform it um, using an unexpected thing, salt, um, and he was able to, to change it so that then the water brought life instead of death. So bringing life out of death um, or bring, you know, transforming sources of death into sources of life does seem to be something of a, like that's why that's the first miracle that Elisha performs. It sets the tone for the rest. But then it's immediately followed by another that is very confusing uh, in verses 23 uh, through 25. And that's that's the, the 42 youth, right? These uh, youth uh, that are making fun of Elisha somehow as he's trying to go up uh, to a temple to Bethel, one of the, the, the royal centers of, of uh, worship of Yahweh, right? And these boys are jeering him, making fun of him, go away, like don't go, don't, they're trying to get, get in his way somehow and make it so that he can't go to the temple or can't go to, to I mean, you know, so they're kind of stopping him from his work um, and apparently making fun of him that he's bald. Um, but uh, then it says that uh, he cursed them and then bears came out of the woods and mauled them. Now it doesn't say that he ordered the bears to maul them, right? Um, he did curse them and then this thing happened. Uh, you know, it, what seems to be happening here is that it's a bit like the nuclear reactor, right? Um, uh, the, these, these people were trying to get in the way of um, Elisha and trying to stop Elisha from doing um, Yahweh's work. And so Elisha said, you're not going to get in my way. Um, and then there's this explosion, kind of like that strange fire uh, that uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, offer in uh, Leviticus that, that burns them up. Um, so this is uh, uh, th these are the two sides of Elisha that you see here in these first two stories. I think that's why they're given one right after the other. Just like at the end of the story of Elisha in 2 Kings 13, we get both this story of of death and a story of life, uh, of life coming out of death. And uh, in both of these, you know, in the, the, the beginning of Elijah, uh, Elisha's story, the story of life coming out of death comes first. And at the very end, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 13, at the very end of Elisha's um, uh, life, uh, the story of death coming out of life comes has the last word. I think those are important, you know, ways of framing uh, the story of Elisha. Uh, but I'm going to uh, read you, uh, there's, I mean, there's these beautiful stories, Elisha and the widow's oil uh, in, in chapter 4, um, verses uh, 1 through uh, 7, where it builds upon uh, the widow of Zarephath miracle uh, that we saw in 1 Kings 17. But there's this extra additional bit that her children, the, this, this poor woman's children, have been somehow sold into debt slavery. Uh, they've been made indentured servants. And uh, their freedom has been taken away because of their debts. And so at the very end of that story, he, he creates this oil, right, that is going to be used to sell the, 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 the proceeds of the oil, to, to, to redeem the children, to buy them out of slavery. And then verse 7, the very end, she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts and your children can live on the rest. Um, so that, so that uh, Elisha is encountering uh, these problems in the economic system of ancient Israel, right? It's not supposed to be like that. Ancient Israel isn't supposed to have debt slaves. They're not 
not supposed to be treating each other this way. And, and if someone's in need, they're supposed to be able to go get what they need, right? That's what Deuteronomy tells us over and over again. The, 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 give the poor what they need. Um, but here we see that that's not happening. Uh, but so Elisha isn't just trying to fight against the powers that be. He's trying to help the people within uh, this, this destructive system at the same time. But then after that, there's a different story of a woman's uh, son who comes back to life. So it's kind of like the widow uh, of Zarephath's story, but it's, you know, it's, it's in the same order even. But there are these differences. Um, uh, that you can see. Uh, uh, but it's the, the, the story of the Shunammite woman, um, which comes back, by the way, in chapter 6, uh, where she also loses her land, and Elisha has to help her get it back. Um, again, this, this uh, idea, kind of like Naboth's vineyard, of land being, the inheritance being taken away, and these, this uh, long-term transformation of Israel's uh, regard for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the weak, um, and trying to uh, undo, you know, Elisha's trying to undo those those transformations in return in some way to call people back to Moses, uh, to, to the law of Moses and the, the, the care for the poor and the vulnerable. Um, but so uh, it's a beautiful story. It's so well written, uh, that story of the Shunammite woman. Um, and I just encourage you to read it because I don't have time to go through it now. The story of Naaman, by the way, uh, the story of Naaman is a, a beautiful story as well, which starts with this um, enslaved Israelite woman, a young woman who has been taken in combat, is now a slave to uh, the the general Naaman of Syria, this great general who also happens to have a skin impurity, right, a, a medical condition, an actual skin condition um, with, that we call leprosy. It's not the same thing as modern leprosy. Um, it's a different. It's probably a bunch of different skin conditions, um, but it's something that would have made him ritually impure. Um, and uh, uh, there's this interplay with uh, Naaman trying to get healed through this famous prophet um, who's in Samaria, that is Elisha. Um, just a couple things to point out about this story. Uh, one is that uh, Naaman assumes that Israel works the way that Syria works, his own country, um, his own, his own uh, kingdom. And that is that the king tells the prophets what to do. But he finds out that the prophet, the king doesn't doesn't command the prophets, and the king doesn't tell God what to do. Uh, you know, the, the the Naaman brings a letter to try to tell the king of Israel, "Hey, can you uh, can you please heal me? Tell your prophet to heal me." And the king of Israel has to freak out because he says, "I, I, I that's not my job. I can't do that. Right? I can't tell the prophets what to do." So this is a story that's that's. Um, the beginning of it is based on the idea that their uh, ancient Israel's prophets work in a different way, and ancient Israel's God works in a different way that other people don't understand. Um, uh, but then also, um, uh, there's this uh, transformation in the story of Naaman, who uh, thinks that the Jordan River is too gross and small, and it, uh, you know the man of God, Elisha, doesn't actually meet him at the door. He doesn't take him seriously as a general. Um, he has to like you know, sort of a, a condescend to get into the Jordan River. It's beneath him. He's this big, important person. Because the Jordan River is actually quite small. It's not the most uh, miraculous-looking river, right? Um, if you've seen the Euphrates River, which goes through Syria, or the uh, Parfar Nabana is what he mentions here, these rivers that go through Syria actually are magnificent and quite large and beautiful. Um, and, you know, the Jordan River is small in comparison. Uh, so he, he thinks this is beneath him and grotesque. Uh, but then, of course, um, you know, God can work through these unexpected places, unexpected people, unexpected circumstances, uh, and bring life out of death. And there's a transformation that happens with Naaman in this story, too, that Naaman becomes a worshiper of Yahweh and becomes devoted to Yahweh alone. He gets it. Um, Elisha doesn't have to kind of preach to Naaman uh, about this like Elijah would have. He just Naaman just gets it. It seems like Elijah might have done his job, that is. So then Naaman says, I got these two problems, right? Uh, one is that I want to take that dirt from the river because that must have been the, the, the thing that saved me, right? Uh, which is not true, right? Uh, it wasn't the dirt that saved. It was Yahweh's power, which can work through any dirt in the world, right? Um, Exodus chapter 20, the very beginning of the, the, the covenant code, right? This, the, the laws in Exodus. So Moses' covenant with God and the people's covenant, really, you know, with God in uh, Exodus, in Exodus 20, right after the Ten Commandments, God says, hey, you can make me an altar of dirt anywhere. It doesn't matter where. Um, you know, that is God doesn't need the dirt, right? Uh, God made all the dirt, so God can use any of it. But uh, instead of telling Naaman, hey, you can't do that, uh, that's that's ridiculous. He doesn't explain all of the points of orthodoxy or right worship, right? He doesn't f force Naaman to conform to everything that he thinks is good Yahwism, right? He just says, go in peace. And the second thing, he's, you know, take the dirt. It doesn't matter if it helps you, fine. Um, you know, which is perhaps surprising to some of us. Um, but uh, then the second thing Naaman says is, uh, you know, I have to help my master, that is the king. The king wants to go and worship at his, uh, his family's shrine, to the family god. Kings usually had family gods that were different from the national gods. 
this is one thing that's very unusual about ancient Israel is that uh, the kings have the same patron god as the people, um, Yahweh. This is very, very unusual in the ancient Near East. Uh, this might be the only occurrence that we have of it. Um, but uh, in any event, um, the, the uh, you know Naaman says, "I have to bring the king." He kind of is he's old and weak, and he kind of hangs on to my arm, and I have to like take him to worship at this temple, and I have to kind of I, I have to kind of bow down, right? Because he has to bow down, and he's holding on to me, so I have to I have to like kneel in front of this this idol and I know I, I don't want to worship it but I kind of have to um, is it okay for me to go in that temple and to do that now you might expect you know a prophet who is zealous for Yahweh to say no way you can't go in there and you can't bow down in front of another god etc etc you know but instead Elisha says go in peace um, you know you're okay uh, and you know it, it, it's a, a, a fascinating moment there's a lot there because peace can mean a lot of different things you know you let your heart be at peace um, but also don't be troubled by this but also uh, you know the, the point is to is to is to make peace with this like the point isn't to follow all the rules exactly um, the point is to create peace um, you know go go in peace um, that is name and you are that you are a general of a, of a huge army um, you know bowing down to God in a temple is not not the main idea the question is how are you uh, conforming your life um, how, how are you living um, what, what are your goals in, in life right now those, those, those sorts of things actually are uh, uh, much more important um, than uh, whether or not you go into the house of Ramon um, some random god uh, of Aram so in any event that seems to just kind of sum up Elisha a bit uh, but I do want to um, read you one more story because this one I think is just amazing. This is in chapter 6, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 24. Uh, and I can't read the whole thing with you, but just to note that at the beginning, once upon a time, it really does kind of start that way, when the king of Aram was at war with Israel, so this is like Naaman's boss, right? Uh, so we're not sure when, but one of these times, the unnamed king of Aram was talking with his officers um, and they were trying to plan a fight, right? So it, it, it does say um, that he was uh, trying to fight. Uh, the word uh, milcham, he's trying to, to attack. And that root lacham, to fight, um, it sounds a lot like the word lechem for bread, uh, which will come up again at the very end of this story. So the beginning is the king of Aram trying to attack the king of Israel. And Elisha is able to find out somehow miraculously the information that's being spoken about in the king's uh, quarters. So the king of Aram is planning to fight and the, Elisha keeps hearing and he keeps uh, hearing this, where they're going to fight and he keeps telling the king of Israel to move his troops. So Elisha's role here is to really kind of stop, like he's stopping the war by uh, making sure that they don't fight, uh, they, don't, they don't meet each other, right? Uh, and he says, you know, all, he's doing this more than once or twice, but that means a lot of times uh, Elisha was doing this um, in, in verse 10. So the king of Aram gets really upset. He says, there's a spy among us, right? Who's the spy? And the generals, uh, like Naaman, uh, he's not named here, but uh, they say, well, it's, it's this guy, Elisha. He, he just knows stuff, right? Um, so we got to kill him first, because if we get rid of him, then we can go get the king of Israel and we can, uh, we can be happy. Right, uh, so then they go to find this little town, Dothan, uh, this this Israelite city where Elisha happens to be, him and his servant, uh, unnamed here, but maybe Gehazi, who had just done something pretty bad in the chapter before. But in any event, uh, the, the 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 young uh, servant of Elisha goes outside and you know sees a huge army surrounding the town of Dothan, about to kill them. Right, this is the Arameans, um, and you can imagine the like the biggest army that they'd ever seen surrounding a tiny town. Right, uh, this is this is uh, terrible. He says, "Alas, master, what will we do?" In verse sixteen, uh, verse fifteen, "Alas" is basically means like we're gonna die. We're gonna die, master. What are we gonna do? And he, <laughs> Elisha says back. Do not be afraid, so an oracle of salvation, for there are more with us than there are with them. You know, the, the kid must look around and be like, there's only two of us, buddy. Um, uh, but then Elisha says, uh, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Now, now the, the boy was looking, right? But so it's not the it's not physical eyes that, that are being spoken of here in this story. It's a different kind of sight. So then he sees, and there's chariots of fire all around the mountain, like the ones we heard about in 2 Kings 2. So this is kind of the divine army, right? Yahweh of hosts means Yahweh of the divine armies. Well, their armies, the, the divine armies are chariots of fire um, that we can't see with our, with our uh, typical eyes, right? Uh, so then the Arameans start to attack right at that moment where the young man sees um, with spiritual eyes the, um, 
the, the chariots of fire all around. Well, the Arameans who don't see this, they start to attack at that moment. And Elisha prays to God in verse 18, strike this people. And that, that verb used in Hebrew, nakah, means really smite or kill kill these people, you know, but, but really it, it means, uh, literally means to hit, um, but it's often used by kings and in, in combat situations to mean kill, uh, smite them, right? Smite this people, please, with blindness. Um, so, and it's not even blindness, actually. That that, that word doesn't really mean uh, like a physical disability of, of, of physical inability to see. The, the Hebrew word there, sanwarim, uh, only occurs one other time in the story of uh, Lot uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, in in the lot when Lot was in Sodom, and this verb is also used there, um, and it does or this uh, uh, adjective, this this, this state of being. Um, uh, unable to see. It's, it's really unable to make sense of things. They, they can still see for sure, but they, they confuse things. They're easily confused um, and they seem to kind of stop wanting to fight. So strike this people please with confusion might be one way to translate that actually. So he struck them with confusion, but it has to do with sight, right? This uh, uh, being able to perceive things, understand them. So they're confused. And then Elisha says, this is not the way and this is not the city. It's a bit like in Star Wars when Obi-Wan Kenobi does the Jedi mind trick. You know, this is not the way. This is not the city. Um, you know, but, but this is not the way can also mean this is not the way to do this. This is not the way to go about this. You don't have to fight and try to kill us. Um, this is not the way to win, right? Uh, but, but also this is literally not the way because Dothan's not near Samaria. What they want is Samaria. They want to kill the king of Israel, right? And he says, this is not the city. Dothan is not the place they actually want to be. They're trying to just kill Elisha so that then they can go kill. So he says, I'll take you. Follow me. I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. That's the king of Israel. I'll, I'll bring you right to him. You want, you want to meet him? Let's go meet him. And then he led them into Samaria. And they walk into the city gates somehow. The, the entire you know, confused uh, Aramean army walks into the city gates. And Elisha then says, oh, Lord, open their eyes uh, so that they can see too. And so then they look around and they're in the middle of the, the city of Samaria. They're, they're arch mortal enemies, right? Right then the king of Israel sees them. You can imagine him like waking up, you know, and like looking out the window and be like, what is, what? It's all of the Arameans and they're all confused and they're standing in the middle of my city. You know, you can see him just start to like rouse up the troops. Let's get them. And he says, father, addressing the, the prophet again, like the prophet's like kind of of a higher stature here than the king, um, even though the kings hate that. Uh, father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And he kind of sounds a little bit like a kid here. It's a kind of a childish thing to repeat this, you know, can I kill them? Can I kill them? You know, I'm, he's like overjoyed. Just I want... Because how are you going to end this conflict? Well, by killing them, of course, and by eradicating the other people, right? But then Elisha says, no, did you capture them with your sword and your bow? Did these people who you want to kill, did you capture them? No, I did, right? So here's what we're going to do. Set food, that is lechem. So instead of lacham, means, which means to fight and kill, and, and instead, instead of lacham, we're going to give them lechem, which is bread put bread before them, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and let them go to their master. And that uh, so that they may eat and drink, that verb for drink is really banquet. Set a set a nice feast for these guys. No, no, they're your guests. Do you talk to your guests this way, right? You're gonna kill them? No, no, you're gonna hospitality, you know. And, and you get this amazing idea that there was a great, so he prepared for them in verse 23, a great feast. And after they ate and they drank and then the king sent them on their way. And they went to their master, that is the king of the Arameans. And the Arameans no longer came raiding into the land of Israel. Um, one of these amazing stories, uh, you know, where you see the kind of prophetic disturbance at work, you know, upending the way that we typically think that we go about things. Uh, trying to help us to see new things, new possibilities where we didn't imagine them before. Walter Brueggemann, a great biblical scholar who was at Columbia Seminary for quite some time, um, one of my favorite biblical scholars, uh, he, he wrote a, a beautiful book called The Prophetic Imagination, where he says this is the prophetic imagination, where pro prophets through God's power can present alternative worlds that we couldn't even imagine existed or could exist. And they can make these things come into being. Um, that's what we're looking for when we look, look, look and read these prophetic stories. Um, it's not just anger. It's not just righteous, you know, kind of righteous condemnation. Um, you know, the prophets are, are really trying to paint an alternative picture of a new world and invite us into that world which looks a little bit more like something um, uh, that, that, that God wants, right? It's, this, is, this is part of God's, how they fulfill God's mission in the world. Part of that is to critique, critique the powers that be, critique the ways that um, we've given up on some of our core uh, uh, beliefs and, and our core uh, um, uh, convictions about how to treat one another. Um, and part of it is about calling us into a new future um, uh, where there is transformation and, and 
striving for something we've, we've never seen, we've never had. Um, so I'm going to stop there with Elisha, but just to say, um, uh, Elisha and Elijah together, uh, if you read these stories very carefully and think about them, and then you go and read, say, the Gospel of Luke, uh, you're going to be blown away. Um, one of the things that I didn't even mention in this uh, is in chapter f- 4 of 2 Kings, 2 Kings 4, the very end of that chapter, it's just two verses. This, it's, it's the feeding of the 100. Um, and when Jesus feeds the 4,000 and the 5,000, what Jesus is doing is replicating something that already happened in 2 Kings 4 with Elisha. Uh, and it's a way of uh, showing with some of the same things that Elijah did with food, uh, you know, this overproduction, overabundance of food, trying to invite people into a mindset of abundance, realizing how much God has given us and how much God has gifted us with, uh, and uh, asking us to move out of the spaces of scarcity, uh, thinking that God has not given us enough or that we need to steal from our neighbor or, or somehow seize something from our neighbor in order to have enough, um, which is the logic that leads to, to violent conflict and trying to take from others. Um, so all to say that uh, uh, I think these prophets are well worth your time. Uh, and in the next video, uh, I'll briefly discuss the fall of the north. So basically from 2 Kings 9 uh, all the way to 17, uh, of which a lot a lot of things happen. So, uh, But I'll condense it uh, for you. And, and Coogan and Chapman go over this in some detail too. So see you in the next video. Mm-hmm.